Okay, for this next video, we're going to do a little review here in a second on this last uh, section. And then also, I just wanted to give you a little history about why these uh, lakes sometimes uh, have so much interest from lake turnover perspectives. So, from a lake turnover perspective, we know that sometimes a lot of gases, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide gas, as well as nutrients that have sank to the bottom in a eutrophic system in particular, but not even just eutrophic, even other ones over a long time, a lot can get trapped down here. And the cold water that's most dense keeps it all down there. So usually not a problem. And if lakes turn over frequently, like every year, we might call them like holomictic lakes. They turn over every year. The lakes in Kentucky, they do this every year, every spring and in fall. They're dimictic. They do it twice a year. There are some lakes that are called um, sometimes they're monomictic once every long time. Or monomictic means once every year. Um, so I'm going to pull up just a little um, background on the different types of lakes. So I mean, this is just straight from Wikipedia, though, but it's easy. It's accurate. It was authored by a good person. So um, the great ecologist uh, G.E. Hutchinson coined this term miramictic. Well, maybe not, uh, but he describes them further in his book, so maybe this person did. But G.E. Hutchinson is what I know. But anyways, holomictic was the older word, uh, and then there's miramictic. So miramictic lakes are lakes that do not intermix. Uh, and ordinary holomictic lakes do this once every year. So we have holomictic lakes that mix once every year. And um, some holomictic lakes are probably dimictic, meaning you do it twice a year. And then I guess polymictic means multiple times. I'm not as familiar with them, but our lakes around here are dimictic. They mix every fall and spring. All right, so getting at these miramictic lakes, the ones that do not intermix. So what about miramictic lakes? So when they don't intermix, these zones stay this way for a really long time. And then when eventually something happens that disrupts the stratification, the mixing can happen. So we can actually have periodic turnover. When we have periodic turnover once every long, long time, all those gases that have been trapped down there can all suddenly get released all at once. So you'll see here, I've got a few examples. I'm going to pull this over. Lake Neos, this is in Cameroon. 1,746 people died in a single night. You can read about, about this event. It's happened at this lake several other times, but this happened on August 21st, 1986. And what had happened was they believe, you know, that some event happened that may have resulted in the water heating up. The lake literally kind of provided a, an explosion. They said that there was water that went up in the air. Um, I, I've, I've heard stories that maybe there was um, some sort of volcanic activity in this area, and then that disturbed this area. Maybe as it heated up, if you heat this water up, um, and it was four degrees Celsius, as it heats up, water will will rise. We know that the four degrees Celsius water sinks to the bottom as you heat that up to five, six, seven, eight, nine, twenty, twenty-five degrees C. As the water heats up from the bottom. It will turn over, and then all those gases that were trapped down there will go off to the to the people that are living around this thing, and that's what caused people to die. Um, I've heard of stories of where there have been uh, landslides where big rocks and stuff fall in and disrupt what's at the bottom and kind of cause a splashing effect and kind of more of a physical mixing by force rather than a physical mixing by just the temperature. So that can happen. Um, there is a um, story that may not have a lot of validity, but it's a theory that um, 
there were lakes like this in Egypt during the times that people may read about or have heard about where there were the plagues uh, on the Pharaoh and not letting, you know, you know, the, the uh, Israeli people, the, you know, the Israelites not letting them go. So the Pharaoh um, didn't do these things. So then all these people died and there were all these plagues. Some people have speculated that there was a large volcanic ash cloud um, that made the climate change uh, and get really cold. So lakes that had not turned over for a really, really long time, instead of turning over once every long time, these lakes finally turned over uh, because it was just so cold. And as it got really cold, the water sank, and then eventually at a certain point in time, the toxic gases came out and killed a lot of people, including, you know, the firstborn children or whatever, and livestock and everything else. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, there have been examples in, on, on many of the continents around the world and Central America and Caribbean islands about turnover events at different times in history where we've had these killer lakes uh, actually kill people off um, by these toxic releases of gases. So not going to happen at Lake Reba. It turns over every year, um, twice a year actually lets those gases out. Um, so really not a problem around here. Um, some places that anticipate this now, there's actually environmental engineering that tries to pump the gases out of the bottom of these lakes before they kill people. And uh, it's just an interesting little little story you can read up or watch probably Discovery Channel videos and things like that on it. All right, so to review this section overall as a whole, um, you know, We've covered these things in previous reviews with the class, so we, we should know those. We've covered these before already. Um, all right, so these are kind of the sections where we've started on these most recent online videos. So what's the name of the process associated with nutrient buildup and lake filling in? So we should know that that's eutrophication. And the two major nutrients that drive this process, you know what they are. So they are N and P, nitrogen and phosphorus. What are the three ways of assessing the trophic status of an end or trophic status index of a lake? Or what are the three ways of determining the trophic state of a lake? And I'm particularly talking about Bob Carlson's um, paper and, and the traditional way. So we should know that we're talking about total phosphorus, secchi depth, and then the, the original one is chlorophyll A. So those three. What are the names of the various trophic states that a lake can have? So, you know, what are the, what are the different types? What's the trophic status of Lake Reba? What's the trophic status of, of Will Green Lake? What's the trophic status of Laurel Lake or Lake Cumberland or the Ohio River at Louisville? What's the trophic state of that? So we're thinking about the eutrophic, oligotrophic, uh, mesotrophic, are they hyper eutrophic? Those are the major ones. And although it's not entirely true that the Greek root words of eu and trophic mean self-feeding, some people have said that. So it uh, has that positive feedback loop going on. So is a eutrophic lake heading towards increased eutrophication by a positive or negative feedback mechanism? So when we have a lake that we would call eutrophic, something like Lake Reba or Will Green Lake, and it's experiencing increased eutrophication, this is what happens to eutrophic lakes. This is that process, if we scroll back, there we go, where are we at? Right here. As we get more and more like this, this happens quicker and quicker and quicker. And it's because of this spiraling. This is a positive feedback loop. Once it starts, it's hard to turn off. It would take extensive intervention to prevent continued eutrophication once you've started it. Because the nutrients get trapped in there. All right. What are the three ways of assessing that? We know that we've covered that. The three trophic statuses, we've covered them. 
All right, so this is a positive feedback loop. What are the three stratified layers of a lake? So when a lake stratifies, especially in this part of the world, in the summertime as well as in the wintertime, but when it stratifies in the summertime, what's that top layer called? So that outer layer, that's the epilimnion. What's the middle layer? The middle layer is the thermocline or the zone of rapid temperature change. And what's another name for thermocline? Metalimnion. All right, good. And then the last one, the deepest layer, the coldest layer, it's below everything. It's the hypolimnion. One word, hypolimnion. All right, water. We should know that water is most dense at what temperature? When is water the heaviest? Is it heaviest when it's frozen? No, it floats when it's frozen. Is it heaviest when it's really hot? As it gets hotter and hotter, it might even boil. It goes off of steam. So as it gets warmer, it usually gets less dense. So ice and boiling water, very low density. Water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. That's when it sinks to the bottom. So that heaviest water is right about four degrees C. Not exactly, it might be like 3.96 or something, but that's when it's most dense. All right, if we were a water plant and we were drawing water from a lake for treatment, where would we draw the water from ideally, especially from a eutrophic or a mesotrophic lake? Would we want to draw from the top? No, because we're going to be pulling in algae and scum and having to screen out, you know, all kinds of stuff. We still have screens on our intakes in the deeper water, but do we want to draw right from the bottom of the lake? No, because we don't want the sediments right off the bottom. So we want to draw from that upper layer of the hypolimnion. That's the, the preferred area. All right, so that's all for this section, and uh, I'll stop the video there and, and uh, your take home exam for this online virtual kind of class that we're doing for the second half of the uh, spring 2020 term. Um, we'll have an online take home exam and that will be your, your first major assignment for uh, the online class. And doing your exam, maybe I'll just make another video on instructions on how to do it, but uh, I'm gonna have you uh, submit the things that you'll fill out the exam like you'll type your answers into it and then you'll send those in because it's just easier for me to grade digitally rather than trying to like hand grade or something you know it's just there's no good way to get the paper version to me so so we'll uh, stop this video here and again if you have any questions you can call me text me email me and I'll put additional information on Blackboard uh, with my other contact details uh, if you don't have them saved already somewhere accessible. All right. Thank you. And hopefully this was understandable this time. I think uh, these videos might help you more than, than if we had met in class face to face. So again, any questions, let me know. And thank you.